Good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D., Pastor of True Vine, NBC here in Houston, Texas. And I thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. And today we're in the book of Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. And the topic is Paul's heavy burden for the church. Paul's heavy burden for the church. And so we're going to look at that. Of course, I'm going to pray. And then I have an overview, and we thank you so much for tuning in for our, to our Bible study. We love you, and we thank you for all the support. So let's pray, and let's get started. Lord, we thank you. We honor you. Lord, we bow before you. And Lord, we lift up your holy name. Lord, we need you right now, Lord, in every single way, shape, fashion, dear God. Help us, dear God, to be a better church. Help us, Lord, to be more like you. Help us, Lord, to be considerate. Um, children of God, Lord, help us, Lord, to have a mind like you, Lord. We love you so much, Lord. We want to be just like you. Help us to walk like you and talk like you. Help us to help others, dear God. And let us not have itchy ears, dear God. And, and Lord, let us receive the real gospel, the true gospel, the only gospel. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 So Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. And here's the overview. Tonight, our Bible study, we come again to our second chapter of Colossians. And it's been a real exciting time for me, I know, um, to study together in this tremendous book. It brings back great memories of our study in the book of Ephesians. It, it, it's kind of like um, going over the same ground in many ways. And, and I'm reminded as I study each week of things that I have learned in the past that the Spirit of God brings to a fresh commitment in my heart. As I go over some of those things that we have seen are really in many ways uh, sister thoughts to the ones that Paul gave to the Ephesian believers. Now, and if you find a great deal of similarity in Paul's letters, realize that Christians in all cities has basically the same problem and basically the same solutions. And therein lies the similarity of these truths. But we're looking at chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, and discussing Paul's burden of the church. We didn't get um, too far last time. Remember, we went over verse 1 and 2 and had it on a different topic. But uh, we'll endeavor to get a little farther this time to cover um, verses 2 through 7 and see just exactly what it was the Apostle Paul desired for the church of Colossae. And the Spirit of God desires for the church and every church, Christian church today. Now, I told you last time that Jesus loved the church and he gave himself for it, according to Ephesians 5, verse 25. And so did Paul. Although Paul's death in the behalf of the church was not um, helpful, but it was not atoning. It, it was not substitutionary. You know, nevertheless, the Apostle Paul gave his life because he loved the church and he loved the Lord. And we mentioned it at the beginning of the last time that probably the basic ingredient necessary for a successful ministry is to love of the church is the love of the church but a man of god must have the basic commitment that he really loves the church in the first love and he first loves the lord and, and then he loves the lord's people and you know the ministry is a very self i shouldn't say self but it's a holy spirit motivated thing okay but it's a very dependent thing upon a man's own motivation there's nobody sort of sitting over you like in some situations of employment saying you have to do this and you have to do that you have to do other things as well but it's very tempting some things uh to go along the lines of least resistance to do what comes naturally if you happen to if you happen to be kind of a loud mouth anyway and be able to stand up and shout off your shout off your mouth i mean shoot off your mouth i'm sorry I'm sorry, my allergies boiling. With some um, sense of logic, and, and you can usually get away with it, and it becomes easily in the ministry sometimes to just substitute your own natural ability for the thing that you know God wants you to do. But I think the thing that finally resolves the issue in your mind is: Do you really love yourself, and are you interested in proclaiming yourself so that people are rather in love with you and rather um, enamored? by your ability or do you love the church enough to give them what god wants them to have no matter what is the cost what it costs you to do it that's really the difference and the man of god somewhere along the line is he going to have a ministry 
blessed by God, must, must come to the place where he says, look, it is important that they get me. It isn't, it isn't important that I come off looking good. It isn't important that um, they get what God wants them to have. And, and that may take a little diligence um, on my part and some sacrifice. It just may, or any pastor's part, it just may. And, and that was the case with Apostle Paul, okay? And I think it's been the case with every true man of God since. Now, because of his great love for the saints, he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, I would that you knew what um, agon, agony, remember agon, agony in Greek, I have for you, for them, Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, not just you, but I love even people who never, ever see me. Those people who make up the church, I love everybody. And because of that, when I see the difficulty, that you're in, when I see the attack that you're under in terms of false teaching, when I know the anxieties of living the Christian life and walking the walk, I have a great sense of agony and struggle and striving on your behalf. And that comes because he loved them. Now, his love had built into it uh, certain goals for the believers. It, it was It's not unlike uh, a parent has for a child a children for their children our children certain goals well we have a little discussion about it sometimes it amounts to even more than a discussion it and the the, the guest of the um the gist of the thing is look kind of a kind of expect more out of you because i care about you and i want you to amount to something and it means a little bit of effort on your part and usually we can encourage that kind of effort now the reason the reason that P apostle paul is Saying what he's saying here is because he his love has certain goals. His love have certain has certain goals. He cares about these people, and he uh, and, and built into that cares a certain anticipation that he that will amount to a certain thing. I can relate to that as a pastor. The thing that gets me so fervent, that works me up, that makes me desire so much to communicate to you these things is because I care about you, and it matters to me. Uh, that you amount to something in the gospel. So let's look at the text. Chapter two of Colossians, verse two, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of mystery of God, both of the father and of Christ. Now we translated that term strengthen. Remember, we talked about that last night, strengthen rather than comfort, because we think that is the more particular emphasis that the Apostle Paul is making here. The, the word means to comfort, to console or to strengthen. It embodies all of that idea. It, it, it even means to grant endurance. OK, and so it's a lot of things. But it seems to me that the sum of all of it all and what Paul is really working on is that their hearts will, would be strengthened. And we saw last time the term heart basically in the Bible has reference to the to the um, intellect and the will to the mind. The Hebrew didn't talk about the brain. He didn't talk. He talked about the heart. Remember, we didn't talk about the brain. The brain, whenever you talk about the brain, it's talking about the heart, talking about the mind, the heart, the heart. The heart was the area of intellect and, and will and learning information and acting on that information on the will of act, uh, will to act, came out of the mind. So the heart means mind. Heart means mind. It's talking about the mind. So the heart means means mind. Remember, it never uses brain. So the heart means mind. Now, what he's saying is, I want your mind to be strengthened. I want your mind, your heart to be strengthened. Your mind. I want strong minds. Why? Because the mind is the first thing that Satan assails. That's the first thing he attacks. Um, you understand? Satan attacks the mind with lies. He is the father of what? Of lies. And he brings around false truth and false information and assaults the mind with it. And that directs the behavior that responds. And so it is necessary to have a strong mind. Now, the term in the Bible, heart, generally is used to refer to the mind and intellect. I just said that. And it and that it's technical uh, meaning. I would add, though, that there are times when the heart is used in general, not technical. 
non-technical, I would say, sense to refer to the totally totality of man's inner being. But when it is used in a technical sense, it is the reference to the mind, the, the seat of knowledge, um, which is basically the beginner of action. So it is necessary to have a powerful, fruitful Christian life to have a strong mind. And the way your mind is strengthened is by filling it with divine with divine truth that can trigger a positive behavior pattern in your will. And then your emotions will be responding. And, and we saw the Hebrews just designated emotions as bowels. Remember your bowels. And so your stomach area. And, and, my, and so we have to remember that. And now the Colossian Christians can protect themselves, Paul says, from the source of false teachers. And you and I can also. When our heart are, are strengthened, when our heart is strengthened, so that's when we begin to protect ourselves. And you and I can also protect ourselves. Now, last time we said that there are several things, several things to understand about this. How is your heart uh, strengthened by the strengthener? Remember that. And we can take the word comforter. As it appears, parakletos, parakletos, in John 14, 15, 16. And as well, translated strengthener. So it is the Holy Spirit that strengthened us. We saw the Ephesians chapter 3 that we needed to be strengthened by his Holy Spirit in the inner man. So the Spirit of God does the strengthening. He does it as we feed on the word of God. Excuse me. He does it through trials and difficulties that come our way. He does it through our teachers and other Christians who minister to us in the spirit and strengthen us, strengthen, strengthen us Sorry, like in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 2. And send Timothy, our brother, the minister of God, and our fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to establish you and strengthen you. So Paul says, I'm sending Timothy because the Spirit will use him to encourage you, to strengthen you. So the Spirit may do it directly in your life. He may do it through the word. He may um, do it through some other believers and your faith. The, ideas, the idea is to have strong hearts. And as you yield to the Spirit, as he works in you, and you yield to the Spirit as you read the Word and discipline yourself to study it. As you yield to the Spirit by submitting yourself to the ministry of other believers, you find your inner man strengthened. Your mind and in, in, in you and your will become, your mind uh, will become strong. And you can have positive action as a result of that and not to fall into misinformation or untruth as Satan would want you to. Now, that brings us to the second thing. The second thing that Apostle wishes for the Colossian Christians and the second thing we should wish for ourselves is that we be united in love, that we be united in love, strong in heart, united in love. And this, of course, is the beautiful balance of number one. We don't want to get carried away with the intellect. We don't want to turn Christianity into something that is coldly academic because that isn't it. So all of that the uh, theology and, and all of that knowledge and all of that brain power is balanced by balanced off by love, right? And so hastily, Paul says, I pray that their hearts might be comforted. And now watch the, watch the next line, being knit together in love, being knit together in love. He wants a one-mindedness, okay? One-mindedness of hearts that are knit together in love. As I said, this is a balancer to doctrine. The word knit or knit together simply means to unite, but it really is a beautiful picture of the body of Christ, all of us being knit together in an in the indivisible kind of oneness. Your body is a combination of billions of cells all knit together. You can't pick any one of them apart because they are blend indiscriminately together. And that's the thing that the Apostle Paul is after, as the cells of, the, of a body are indistinguishable because they're lost in the mass so should you be indistinguishable as your your loss uh in the unity of love exists among the brethren number three verse three in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge so it means they're hidden listen to this from everybody but the christian all of you all you've got to do is go in there and pick them up and you know what it's like. This is like a diamond mine that somebody blasts the lid off and, and you just walk in and pick up the diamonds. They're all there. 
And all you have to do is study to show yourself approved unto God. Excuse me. All you have to do is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. All you have to do is apply yourself as yourself a little bit and you can go in and pick them all up. And of course, the, the heretics, um, they believe that all wisdom and knowledge was hidden in their mass elevated material treasures. Hidden, the word hidden is an interesting word in the Greek. And that's ap, 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 apokrufos, apokrufos, from which we get um, apokrufos. And hidden, hidden, the, the heretics, the, the false teachers believed that there was a great mass of divine knowledge necessary for the salvation. It, uh, it was hidden in the secret books. And the secret books were called Aprocrufos. And only those super intellects could open them. And Paul says, Balani, the only Aprocrufos where all of this stuff is hidden is Jesus Christ. And, and the day you open your heart, day you open your heart to Christ, God took the lid off the diamond mine and just said, go ahead, take what you need. It's all there. You just need the Bible. The revelation of the one in there is enough. That's, this is the revelation of God. And so that's all you need. There's enough wealth there. Paul just says, boy, if you could only understand it, it'll, it'll blow your mind off. In Ephesians 1, 17, it reads, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what it, is, what it is, the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory and of his inheritance and the saints. He says, I pray for you that you might just get a grip on, on what's there for you. Staggering. It's all there. So Paul says, I want you to be settled on this one thing. Jesus is God. Verse two, second thing, he is all of all sufficient and in him is everything that man needs. And so that brings us to verse four. And it reads, now this I say, at least anyone should be deceived. You with uh, persuasive words, at least anyone should be deceived. You proceed, deceive you with persuasive words. And this is this is the thing, how we become, how we become um, have these itchy ears and and we become wayward. And so um, and we're tossed and driven like like a ship in the, in the sea by any type of word that we hear because we believe it we're, we're gullible and so you say paul why are you so hot about this why are you so concerned because of verse four and i'm saying this at least any man should uh beguile you with enticing words like um lightfoot translates it i wish to warn you against anyone who would lead you astray by uh, suspicious arguments and persuasive rhetoric He's saying, I don't want you to exchange proven riches for speculation. So it's sad when a Christian would come to a place where he listened to some of that garbage about Christ. Well, I don't know, but I've always believed the other way. See, Paul is saying, look, uh, have a subtle conviction. And I'm telling you this, at least anybody is going to be to beguile you with enticing words, clever phrases and they're clever and their arguments are good. So don't let people beguile you. Don't let people pull you in with their with their big words that they're using or whatever the, the, the persuasive words that they're using um, in that false gospel. So don't do that. Don't let them pull you in. Verse five. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness, fat, steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So this is the basic attack of false systems. They'll deny two things. They'll deny the deity of Christ. Now mark it in your mind. They'll, they'll do it. They'll deny the deity of Christ. They'll deny his sufficiency to save. So they'll deny the, the, the deity of Christ and they'll deny the, his sufficiency to save one or the other or both. So they'll come and say, oh yes, yeah, Christ saves plus works, right? Or yes, Christ isn't God. But these are the two things around which are all the false stuff revolves. All this stuff revolves around that. It, it is a denial of the deity of Christ in his 
his or and or his sufficiency to save alone. So the deed of Christ and the sufficiency to save alone. And the cults are all brought to the bar of God right here and condemn folks, all of them, every last one of the cults that we have today. Anything that reduces Christ to less than deity or anything that adds anything to his saving sufficiency belongs in beguiling activity of Satan. So anytime you diminish Christ, anytime you take away his sufficiency, that is a cult. That is false doctrine. So Paul desires the Colossians and all Christians to resist the seductive teaching of Satan. And it could only be done by having settled convictions, deep down confidence. He says, now I've just warned you, I've just told you what I feel. But I'm just saying thanks that even though I am not here in the spirit, in my inner man, I'm thankful that you, have you haven't you have collapsed yet. I'm thankful, though I'm not there, I'm thankful um, you haven't gave in yet. And so I'm thankful you're still hanging in there tough. I, I always think of the, of, uh, of like, um, somebody just hanging in there, hanging from something. You just hanging in the Olympics. They, how, how, how they swing from the bar and they just hanging in there and they haven't let go, um, until it's time to in a performance. And so, it's amazing. You, you hang in there, even in, in the other Olympic Games. You're hanging in there. You don't let go. You don't give in until you complete the race. And so that's the thing. Uh, we as believers shouldn't give in to any type of doctrine. Don't give in to any type of doctrine. He says, I'm glad that you're hanging in there. I can't be physically present. I am slightly detained. De detained for three years or more as a prisoner in Rome. I see no um, immediate hope of release, but I certainly am supportive of you in my spirit. I am so thrilled to know that you're hanging in there. I have a happy confidence that um, because of notice that um, this, a beautiful thought, your your order and steadfastness, fastness, both of those words are military terms. The, the word order, taxes, is an interesting word. It means rank. It means a single file line of soldiers. You're still holding rank. And you know what happens when an army begins to lose the battle. The ranks begin to become depleted. They begin to sh uh, shoot them down. And, and, and this comes from way back. The army would do out in um, a, a, a flanks, okay? And and they just start shooting them down and they'll be falling. And if you... If, You've seen it in some old movies how they do it. The British used to do that. They're charging the the, the charging rank. They're charged in rank and and, and well, it, it was the stupidest thing I ever saw. They all run out there and half of them would get killed. Yeah, it was so crazy. Like why would you just run out there and people shooting at you? I don't know. And, and they'll go back and regroup and rank would be this big. See, and it, it was just steady diminish. No wonder we won the Revolution of War. Sitting ducks, you know, they just run out there and get killed. I, I don't know. I never understood that, but but they but they would get in rank and they would stay in the rank and they would charge in rank and you would try to break their ranks. And he's saying you may be you may be being attacked, but nobody was broken. But nobody has broken rank. Everybody's in the single file. You're holding the line. Nobody's being shot down yet. Um, that's good, and I'm happy. Well, now. What's he so excited about? Listen, folks, an ounce of prevention, right? And then he uses another term, steadfast, stero stereoma, stereoma in Greek. It, this, um, again, speaks of a solid front of soldiers ready to stand the shock of attack. And it speaks of more, not just unbroken rank, but uh, solidarity. And so, and not only are you unbroken in, in your rank, but men, you are standing firm. And when the stop, when the shock of battle hits, boom, you're going to stop. You're going to stop it. I rejoice. You, you're obedient. You're, you're disciplined. You're holding rank. You're going to stand the attack. And that makes me so happy. Yet I warn. He says, yet I warn. And I say that to you, um, True Vine Church and to all the church around the world, the people um, that's listening to this video, no matter that I know of, um, has been, nobody that I know of has been shot uh, down in the ranks, although I'm sure there are some that are being worked on. And so far, I feel like if anything hits us, we'd stand firm. Boy, we, we'd be there. But I warn you, I warn you, it happened in the churches where the Apostle Paul was a pastor in later years. Hold 
your ground. Y'all hear me? Hold your ground. So what does he say? Strong in heart, united in love, settled, settled in understanding. Let me give you a fourth one. Walking in Christ, walking in Christ. So we must walk in Christ. Remember my prayer at the beginning? Help us to walk like you. Help us to talk like you. So we must know our walk in Christ. Be careful with your walk in Christ. Christ. So verse six, as you therefore have received Christ, Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. That's like a charge. Now, since all of those other things are true, therefore, you're now settled in Christ. You're confident about Christ. You're firm in Christ. If that's true, then keep on walking in Christ, right? Don't waver. Don't change. As you have received the truth, um, Erosis, uh, um, which speaks of a dec decisive point in time past, you receive Christ, you receive him as Lord, you declared him as Lord, you have, the, you have that settled, confident assurance, therefore keep walking in him. Don't waver. And what, what does walk mean? Daily lifestyle, daily conduct, keep walking in him. So your daily conduct, check your daily conduct. The primary impetus of this point is don't change in your view of Christ. Don't let your uh, Christology flounder. Keep walking in Christ, but the upshot of it is walking in Christ means more than just walking along believing uh, something. It, it means walking in union with Christ. That's what it means. Following Jesus, doing what he would do. What would Jesus have done? And not only to maintain uh, continuing faith in him, a continuous settled conviction, but to maintain a continuing pattern of life pattern um, after him, Paul says, this is what I pray for. You've received him. Don't forsake him, but walk as he walked. First uh, John 2 and 6, first John 2 and 6, it says, um, he that says he abides in him ought himself also so to walk. So if you, if you claim you walk, if you claim you abide in Christ, you should also walk in Christ. You, we should see the action. And you say you abide in Christ, then walk the way Christ walked. Well, how did Christ walk? He walked in love. He walked in wisdom. He walked in truth. He walked in spirit. He walked in holiness. All those things that describe the walk of the Christian is Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 5 were characteristic of Christ. So if you're a Christian, pattern your life after him. The choir said, uh, there's some choirs of the song that say, wasn't it old oh, to be like thee? What, what Wasn't it all oh, to be like thee or old oh, to be like thee? That and that's it. That's Psalms of, 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 of the part. That's some of the parts of the song out. And so uh, what is it like um, to walk it like Christ? I, I, I learned in my head. I, I live it out in my life. I get a settled conviction that Jesus, who the Jesus is who he claimed. And then I set my life goal to be like him, to walk as he walked, to make my lifestyle like his lifestyle. Then he asked for part of, he asked for of them he, in verse seven to kind of sum it up, four points. And incidentally, the tenses of the verbs here are critically important. It's a perfect um, point, the perfect point having been rooted, having been rooted. You are rooted in Christ. When you're in Christ, you should be rooted in Christ. Verse seven, rooted and built up in him established in the faith as you have been taught abounding in it with thanksgiving abounding in in thanksgiving so you've already been rooted like a tree with deep roots in such rich soil drawing its nourishment so the christian is deep deeply rooted in christ and the source of the life nourishment and growth and fruit then being built up that presents you have been rooted and you're you're being rooted up as you walk in him listen now i'll say this it is only when you do what christ uh would do that you what grow that you mature did you get that you are being built up as you walk in him whenever you you do, de do the deeds of the flesh. You're not building yourself up. You are, what are you doing? You're tearing yourself down. So you are built up when you walk in him and, and you obey him. The source of that, of course, is the word of God. Acts 20, verse 32. I commend you to be the word of his grace, which is able to what? Build you up. The word build, builds us up. Jude 20, 
He says, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. How do you build yourself up? By knowing the word, the will of God, obeying it, and you're built up. What will be the result? You will be established in faith. That's a present passive. You will become established. God will establish you. You walk in him because you're rooted with him. And, and as you walk in him, you are being built up, edified, only in the terms of the positive when you walk in him. You're not edified any other time. If you're not walking in Christ, you're not edified. But when you are, you are. And when you're walking in him and built up, God will establish you um, solidly, solidly, solidly in things that you have been taught. And all of a sudden, you find that information takes root in your life. You'll see your growth. Well, God wants uh, established Christians, solid, deep-rooted, strong, and you don't get pushed around by false information. And here's how. Get the word in your mind and He's come full circle, incidentally. Um, he, he gets all the way back to being established in faith. You've been taught all the way back to here again. Start out by feeding on the word of God. Let it produce activity. That the activity will give you settled conviction. And the conviction will be the cry, that Christ is who he claimed. And then you can claim all of his promises and begin to walk step by step like he walked. And that's where your life will come from. And as you walk in him, you'll be built up and you'll even be more established in faith. And then he's, he, then there's a final thing, a last thing, strong in heart. Excuse me, strong in heart, united in love, settled in, in understanding, walking in Christ. And lastly, the response to all of it, abounding in thanksgiving. The end of verse seven, the fourth of those um points and we just separated it out separated it out it because it's the only one in the active voice it's a response to the others abounding with thanksgiving a response to others abounding with thanksgiving what should be the life attitude of a christian what should be the life attitude of a christian thank you thank you thank you for the riches that i'm enjoying for the life that i'm living for the walk that i am walking. God bless you. God bless you. And I thank you so much for tuning in for this Bible study, Paul's heavy burden for the church. And may you have a blessed rest of your week. Tune in Friday for the pastoral moment while I get to encourage and enlighten you with the word of God. And remember, let's pray for each other. Keep each other lifted in prayer. For we are the church. We must edify one another. One another. And that's the importance of the church coming together to edify one another. Uh, another. God bless you. And I thank you once again. We are True Vine. We love you so much. And we're praying for you. You know why? Because we are True Vine and we are the church of love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via cash app at dollar sign TVMBC or by mail at True Vine Missionary Baptist Church, 1407 Grove Street, Houston, Texas, 77020. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.